Okay, here's Emily. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I know we were scheduled for this um, a few months ago. And, uh, I had to reschedule, so I really appreciate uh, the flexibility, and I've been looking forward to doing this for a very long time, so glad to be here. Um, and uh, this talk is sensory processing. Um, there's a lot of general information, but um, I'll also be going over how it um, might specifically apply to people with EDS or HSD. Um, so about me, I'm an occupational therapist. Um, I've worked in a variety of settings. And one thing I noticed working with kids and adults and kind of all over the country was that there were not enough um, resources for adults or older kids who had trouble with sensory processing. Um, so that's kind of the way my career is going now. I do some other things too, um, but I kind of wanted to, to be the OT that I wish I had when I was a, a teen and young adult. Um, I uh, I was honored to um, contribute to the book Disjointed. I wrote a few chapters from that. Um, I have my own practice in California, that's telehealth, um, and I'm the co-founder and co-leader of the Silicon Valley EDS support group. So that's how I found out about you guys, because um, a lot of us are connected, um, you know, just through uh, EDS echo training or um, friendships, things like that. Um, also, I have EDS myself. I have the hypermobility type. Um, you can see me here. Oh, let's see. I haven't actually done the slideshow yet. Why don't I do that? There we go. Okay. Now <laughs> you can see me with um, a fellow zebra. Um, and I'm also, uh, um, I was like a very, very big, I call them sensory kids. Um, and I grew up to be a sensory adult. So I am very sensitive <laughs> um, to a lot of things. Um, this picture right here, um, hopefully you can see my arrow um, on the screen was kind of how I spent childhood um, with my with my fingers in my ears. Um, and I would overreact to a lot of things. Um, so uh, I do have a lot of personal experience with this. When I first learned about sensory processing in OT school, it was kind of an epiphany. And it's one I like to share with other people because um, hopefully um, knowledge about it can help people like it's helped me. Um, I have no conflict of interest. I'm going to minimize the window so I can see my whole screen. Okay. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, obviously, if you're having concerns, please um, consult your doctor or therapist. And this is especially true if you ever have sudden onset neurological changes, because um, that could be something much more serious than sensory processing. Um, and you want to definitely have that, um, ha have that checked out promptly by a doctor. Um, and also, please uh, always consult a doctor or therapist before starting, stopping, or changing any exercise. Um, I want everyone to be safe, um, so I always make sure to say these things uh, at the top. All right, so first I want you to think of, um, this may take you back to primary school or elementary school, how many senses do we have? And you probably have a number in your head. Um, and actually, this is kind of a trick question because there's lots of different answers. Um, so, you know, like I said, in elementary school, you probably learned about the five senses. I've read papers where um, some scientists will say we have up to 26 senses um, or possibly more. Um, but for OTs and for the purpose of this talk, we have, drum roll, eight senses. Um, so these are the eight sensory systems that we'll be talking about. Um, I'll go over them briefly, um, and I'm going to use kind of the like more accessible common terms than the fancy, um, you know, research-based terms. So instead of olfactory, I will refer to this sense um, as smell from here on out, but I wanted to have both words on here just in case. So there's the ones you're probably familiar with, smell, taste, touch, hearing, and vision, um, pretty straightforward. And then there's also um, three these three other senses that you may not be as familiar with. Um, so there's proprioception, which is body awareness. So that's where your body is in space, how it's moving, how much force you need. Um, and that is something that a lot of people with EDS and hypermobility, possibly everyone, is probably has um, some some issues with this sensory system, um, and I'll get into why in a little bit. 
And then there's the vestibular system, which is our balance and spatial orientation. So while proprioception is where our body is in space, the vestibular system is where our head is in relation to gravity. So are we upside down? Are we right side up? Are we accelerating or decelerating? Things like that. And then there's um, interoception, um, or depending on who you ask, it might also be called or pronounced interoception. I might go uh, back and forth between the two because I've learned from um, professors who pronounced it both ways. Um, and this is internal body sensations, um, which is things like, you know, do I have to go to the bathroom? Am I hungry or full? Am I getting overheated? Um, kind of like deep visceral pain, things like that. Um, so there's our eight sensory systems, which will be the basis for pretty much this whole talk. Um, so each of these sensory systems has a sensory pathway, um, and it starts with what's called a primary sensory organ, gets activated. So for example, in vision, that would be the eye, um, or the rods and cones in the eye get activated by light. And then um, the primary sensory organ will travel through nerves. It will take that message from the outside world. It will travel through nerves into the central nervous system and into the brain where it is processed and then repackaged to give the body instructions on how to act. And then that message travels through nerves again, and then it tells various parts of the body how to react or not react. Um, Cause not everything we experience requires a reaction. And here's another, um, this is kind of going over the same thing, just in a different format because different brains learn different ways. Um, so here we see someone's feeling um, the temperature of the water. Well, I'm gonna make up that they're feeling the temperature of the water. They could be feeling uh, the texture or the force of the water as well, but let's say temperature. And um, that activates the touch system um, in their fingertips. And then that information goes through nerves into their central nervous system. It goes in the brain, gets processed. The brain uh, makes a decision. It incorporates things like emotion and past experiences and things like that. And then that goes back through the central nervous system um, and back to the hand, but also the body in general. So maybe if this person wanted to get in the shower, but the water was too cold, um, the brain's response and the body's response might be to say, well, let's turn the hot water on more. Um, and so we're going to talk um, a lot about when things go wrong, but not every difference is something going wrong. Um, so everyone processes things differently. Um, I, I think anyone with siblings can really, really know, you know, how many arguments are from the volume or the content of sound um, playing in the car. Um, or, you know, how, how you organize your room, if you share a room, things like that. So think of some of these things, think of what your preferences are and maybe the preferences of people, you know, um, like, you know, if someone really likes spicy food, um, or, and someone really likes bland food, neither of them are wrong. Um, that's, that's not disordered, um, sensory processing. That's just sensory differences, um, which is all in the realm of normal. Um, and usually, uh, you know, not not too bothersome. Um, but when it does become a problem, um, so there's something called sensory processing disorder. So that's when um, the differences in sensory processing are so pronounced that it is really impeding comfort and function um, multiple times a day, um, definitely on a daily basis. This diagnosis isn't officially recognized by a lot of I don't know, the people who make these decisions. Um, so like the DSM, which is something a lot of healthcare professionals use, um, there's efforts to get that in there. Um, but so so far, um, it, it's not like an official diagnosis. Um, but I still think that using this model is helpful when we're talking about di disordered sensory processing. Um, and this is the Miller model. She is like um, occupational therapy royalty because she's done um, a lot. Oh, that's my insulin pump. Uh, unfortunately, that will be beeping apparently <laughs> um, throughout this talk. So sorry about that. Um, anyways, so this is the model I generally use. There are other models out there. Um, and we're going to focus today on the areas in the boxes. So we're going to focus on sensory problems that look like over-responding. Um, so that is something, um, oh, let's see, like, you know, 
maybe getting a shot in your arm. That's on my mind. A lot of people I know are getting boosters and flu shots and everything. And um, to someone, they might, you know, barely feel it or they feel it and it's fine. They roll back their sleeve down, put a bandaid on, go about their day. And for some people, it can be excruciating. Um, or even if it's not excruciating, their body could be sent into like kind of this fight or flight, um, like they're in danger from from this um, shot. And it's the same shot, you know, in, in different people's arms and they react differently. Um, again, sorry about that beeping. <laughs> um, and then there's the opposite, which is sensory um, under responding. So um, this you see in kids all the time who are eating and they just have food smeared all over their face as if it's face paint. And you look at them and you think, how can you possibly not know that you're covered in food? Um, and that's an example of under responding to sensory input. And then there is also um, we're still in this box right here, um, sensory craving. Um, so that is um, like if you have trouble sitting still, um, we talk about that a lot in kids, but uh, plenty of adults have trouble sitting still as well. I am one of them. Um, and so it's someone who's always um, craving um, different sensory input. Um, and you can be one or all of these or none of these. Um, it's It's not like um, if you're one of the people who over responds to an injection that, um, that you're going to be over responding to everything. You'll also be over responding to every smell or, um, every taste. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, and one of the reasons why I kind of go away from, from this, when I work with clients is that, you know, it's putting everyone in boxes. There's literally little boxes here. Um, and I think it's more useful to just kind of talk about um, disordered sensory processing, which could be something very specific, or it could be kind of more of like a broader picture of who you are. Um, and then in this little square over here, it's difficulty distinguishing between um, different types of sensory input. So that's like, I hear um, my, um, you know, significant other calling me. Are they calling me from the room in front of me? Are they calling from the room behind me? Are they close? Are they far? Things like that. Um, and there's a lot more to this. There's, you know, this whole area in the middle and lots more. Um, and that will be for another talk and another day. Um, I find um, the um, over-responding, under-responding and, and all that to be more accessible to a lot of people um, and kind of uh, more part of daily life. So I like to focus on that. All right, um, and so we'll go over this in more detail. I'm gonna talk about each of the sensory systems and what it might look like if things are going wrong, but um, there's some kind of commonalities. So the big one is um, inappropriate fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Uh, you might've just heard about it as like fight or flight before. And that's basically the sympathetic nervous system is activated and um, it is telling you that you are in danger um, and that you need to mobilize resources to react to that danger. Um, and that's great when you're running from a tiger, <laughs> um, which luckily we don't really have to deal with very much anymore. It's not so great when you're sitting in class and a door slams somewhere down the hall and suddenly you're, you know, shaking and feel like you need to, you know, hide under the desk or, or something. Um, and that might sound like an exaggeration, but it's not for some people. Um, and maybe some of you um, are, you know, are also like that. Um, there's also kind of the other reaction. Um, if you are feel under threat or overwhelmed, you might kind of more shut down. So that's things like spaciness, feeling like you're in a dream, not connected to your body, fatigue, trouble concentrating. Um, some people, like if you're um, sensory craving, uh, you might be fidgety and boisterous and maybe you don't have um, a good sense of personal space. Um, and that could be perceived as aggressive um, when that's, you know, that's not the case. It's just you're getting different messages from your body than other people. Um, anxiety in unfamiliar environments. And this makes sense because when it's something, uh, when we're in a familiar environment and things are predictable, we know roughly what sensory information we're going to deal with. We can prepare. And even if we don't consciously do that, um, there's probably a lot going on underneath the surface that's helping us to prepare for the situation. But if we don't know what the situation is going to be, then we don't know how to prepare. Um, so things that are unfamiliar or unpredictable um, can cause anxiety. Um, clumsiness, poor posture, inefficient movements, frequent injuries, 
um, things like that are common, um, and also kind of how fast you process things. So either being impulsive and kind of reacting before you really have a chance to process, um, or on the other side, troublemaking decisions. Um, and again, you can be both neither or um, one or the other. Um, there's no there's no rules um, that you have to be one way or another. Um, having an excessively active or excessively sedentary lifestyle. Um, and I say excessively because it's perfectly okay to be active. It's perfectly okay to be more on the sedentary side. But um, if you're excessively either of those things that could have like social implications, learning implications, um, or health implications. Um, it can also look like challenging behaviors. Um, that's more talked about um, with kids, but it can be with adults too. Um, this is, you know, a whole nother topic, but behavior generally is, is um, more communication. Um, I think when, when I was younger, the idea was kind of that behavior was like manipulation. Um, we're moving away from that now and that, you know, in general, people are just doing their best. So if there is a challenging behavior, it's good to look at the why. And sometimes that why is sensory. Um, and if things um, get really extreme, there could be meltdowns, shutdowns, or burnout. So meltdowns may kind of look like tantrums, but a tantrum um, has an aim. So like, I, I want the blue cup, not the green cup. And as soon as I get the blue cup, oh, like I'm okay now. I don't need to cry anymore. Um, but with a meltdown, that's when someone is actually not in control anymore. Um, and if they get um, like say it started because they wanted something. Um, if they get that something, they're still going to be melting down because it has less to do with um, one individual thing. And it's more just kind of like sensory or emotional overload in general. Um, the other side of that is shutting down um, where if you're overwhelmed, you might not be able to speak um, or communicate um, as effectively as usual. Um, and then if things go on a long time, um, there can be burnout where you might need days, weeks, or months to kind of rest and reset. Um, and one thing I really want to stress um, is that too much, not enough, or the wrong kind of input can be painful. Um, so, you know, if you've ever had a migraine, think of how um, sound and light is literally painful. Um, and that's how I describe things, you know, if parents are having a hard time understanding why um, their child can't function in a crowd, um, I might, you know, say that it could be literally painful. Um, or like, you know, sitting still could literally be painful. It could be agonizing for some people if their body is telling them they need to move. Okay. Um, and um, so that was all general. Now we're going to talk about how um, having EDS or hypermobility um, kind of impacts this whole picture. Um, and basically EDS can affect the whole length of the sensory system. So it's not surprising that a lot of us do have sensory issues. Um, so primary sensory organs can be impacted. Um, so for example, our joints are hypermobile and the sensors um, the, or the primary sensory organs of proprioception are in and around joints. So it makes sense that a lot of our proprioception um, does not function like um, typical. Um, also body structures that react to the stimulus. So once the brain has decided what to do and sent that message out back out to the body, um, our bodies are different. They work different. Um, and so we may react differently. Um, and, uh, we can have central nervous system changes. Um, so like, for example, like cervical hypermobility, if you're, um, very, you know, very hypermobile in your cervical vertebrae or any vertebrae and your, uh, uh, spinal cord is getting squished, uh, that's going to have, you know, that's going to have bearing on how you get sensory information and how you respond to it. Um, and I particularly see this in people who have high or low intracranial pressure. Um, that's something um, that's that's really common, especially sensitivity to sound and light. Um, and this, again, I'll, I'll pause here to remind everyone, please talk to your doctor or therapist um, because you know, you, you never know what the underlying condition is going on. Um, sometimes it's just sensory processing and maybe some practice and some therapy can help, but sometimes you really need to address the underlying condition. Um, then there's also peripheral nervous system damage. Um, so that would be things like, 
you know, a nerve entrapment or carpal tunnel or scar tissue from surgery can um, change how we, uh, how we, um, the sensation or the messages travel through our nerves. Um, and then also, um, most people with hypermobility probably have at least something else going on. Um, usually to get the diagnosis, there's, there's more than, um, just hypermobility going on and things like anxiety, dysautonomia, neuro, neurodevelopmental disorders, um, like ADHD and autism, chronic pain, all those things, um, also impact our body and it can, um, kind of combined and compound what we're feeling sensory. Hold on one second. It looks like some people are trying to get in here. Okay, sorry. Hopefully we won't have to pause too much. Um, welcome if you're just joining us. Um, oh, and uh, the last note is um, a, a problem in one area can cause um, dysregulation in other areas. So, um, I actually recently read a paper where some doctors were suggesting that um, that just having impaired proprioception alone um, could be so dysregulating um, to the body that it causes all of the other sensory systems um, to dysfunction as well um, and may have some impact on mood and energy and things like that. It's just one paper. It was a small sample size. Um, so I find it more interesting than, um, you know, for sure what's going on. Um, all right, let's see. Um, and this kind of just goes back over things um, about how all these things um, contribute to how we feel. Um, and so it's really important that we have a multidisciplinary approach um, because if we are so good, we're so educated and we're so on it with our sensory um, processing um, and we have our chronic pain managed uh, and we're, we're great with mental health, we're working with a great therapist and um, it's going well, but we have dysautonomia that's out of control. Um, that can also cause these other things to be a bit out of control. Um, and so all these kind of all these things kind of go into what I call like self-regulation, how much energy you have, how your mood is. Um, so it's always important to address everything. Um, so now, now on to the good stuff of what can help. Um, and I'll go over these again in more detail for each system, but there's some things that are kind of universal. Um, so first I'll actually skip over to the right side over here um, with um, consultations with other um or with, with therapists or doctors. Um, a lot of people actually address some aspect of sensory processing or primary sensory dysfunction to some extent. So um, you may work um, with a speech language, patho speech language pathologist, <laughs> um, OT, PT, um, vision therapy, vestibular therapy, psychotherapy. I'm sure I'm forgetting people. Um, there's also certain types of specialties um, who work with sensor issues as well. Um, and I won't go over that in future slides because it's the same for everyone. Um, but then there's practice and compensatory. Um, and so practice is basically engaging with your sensory systems. Um, they're kind of a use it or lose it. Um, I don't, that's not necessarily universal, but they have done a lot of studies that show if you kind of retreat from uncomfortable, um, sensory, um, input and you do that, um, enough and often enough, it can actually end up causing the sensitivities to get worse. Um, so, you know, be engaged as much as you can, um, you know, even from bed, there's, you know, fidget toys. Um, if a caregiver can change the sheets, have a soft blanket, things like that are all really important. Um, it's important to, uh, during this practice, make sure that you are, um, in the right mood for it. Um, you don't want to do it when you're rushing. You definitely don't want to do it when you're forced. Um, and I, I say that, you know, kids are usually who we think of as someone being forced to do something like forced to, uh, wear the scratchy wool, um, jacket or forced to clean their plate. Um, and this can actually make sensory issues worse. Um, so avoid that, you know, when we can, um, gradual exposure, um, which I'll go over in a little bit because that's kind of uh, controversial and complicated, but that's basically the idea of um, starting kind of below the level of where something becomes extremely uncomfortable and um, over time increasing the 
amount or the volume of exposure. So, or intensity, I should say. So in the case of volume, um, actually with my dog, we did this, uh, works on dogs too, not just people. Um, since she was a puppy, I would play sound of fireworks. Um, and I started at a really low volume and just every, I don't know, when I remembered, I would increase the volume. Um, and when it came to the first holiday with fireworks, she was interested but she wasn't really scared because um, she had that gradual exposure. Um, also, it should be fun. Um, you know, pairing things with uh, pleasurable and happy experiences are going to um, kind of cement those things in your brain as happy things. So even if it's, um, you know, difficult sensory exposure, you can make it less so. Um, let's see, I'll admit a few more people. Welcome if you're just joining us. Um, then there's also compensatory. So this is, um, you know, so practice is kind of like, what can I do now that might help me in the moment, but is going to help me in the future too. Compensatory is I can't cope right now, or I'm uncomfortable right now. What can I do? Um, so one thing is be in control. Um, so if, you know, maybe you have trouble with the volume of music that is being played in the house. Maybe you get to be in charge of how how loud that is and how long the music is at that higher volume. Um, taking breaks, um, masking or muting sensory input. So I just said not to do that. And what I meant by that was don't do it all the time. Um, so if you're going to a concert, that might be a great time for um, earplugs. But um, you know, unless you have like a really severe case and are probably already working with this with the therapist, it's not great to wear earplugs all the time because um, then things can actually get worse. Um, and also, you know, to strategize, to do things, um, you know, thoughtfully think about, you know, if you're again going to a concert, you know, that's going to be difficult for you. What can you do ahead of time during and after to make it a more enjoyable and more comfortable experience? So here we're going to kind of get into problems with the graded exposure. Um, you know, everyone's nervous system is different and um, our nervous system can react to sensory input in different ways. So the idea with graded exposure is that it will desensitize us. Um, so, you know, you put, um, you know, face paint on your face and at first it is horrible. Um, but then as you are walking around and, um, you know, maybe at the carnival or wherever going trick or treating, um, you start to notice it less. Um, and maybe you don't notice that at all. Um, or maybe you start with having just like a line of face paint on your face and then you wash it off right away. And then maybe the next day you leave it on for a little bit longer. Um, and as, over time, your body becomes more, um, more used to it, doesn't pay as much attention to it. And this can be really powerful. Um, it's used in anxiety treatment um, and also for sensory sensitivities. But not everyone's nervous system reacts like that all the time. Um, so sometimes you're exposed to something and the more times you are, um, the worse it gets, the more it registers. Um, and the case that a lot of people use to illustrate that is um, you know, a kid goes to school and they're happy, they love school. And then there's the fire alarm because someone burned pop popcorn and they're like, ooh, I really didn't like that, but okay, I can go on with my day after it stopped. And then a few days later, you know, there's a drill or someone burned popcorn again. And this time they're gonna have a bigger reaction and then a bigger reaction and then a bigger reaction to the point where they're afraid to go to school. Um, and this is definitely something that, that actually happens. A lot of OTs do a lot of work around, um, fire drills. So it can cause sensory sensitivities to get worse. So, um, if, if that is something you're noticing, um, that would be a good time to stop and regroup. Um, and if it's something that's happening a lot, um, you may want to work with a therapist, like a, an OT, um, or, or a PT or vision therapy, depending on what, what the issue is. Um, to, to use other strategies. Um, so I just wanted to have this here because if you like, I'm trying to do this practice thing and it's just making it worse. Um, uh, that's totally valid. That happens. Um, okay. So now we're going to go in, um, over like each sensory system, um, and kind of go into greater detail. Um, and this is smell. Um, and this is the primary sensory organ that's located like in the nasal cavity. I think these are kind of cute. <laughs> they look like little upside down trees. 
Um, so what, what does it look like if you have sensory processing issues with smell? Um, obviously bothered by smells, um, but this, you know, everyone's bothered by smells. So this would be bothered by smells that other people find neutral or pleasing. And to the extent where it's causing, um, you know, unexpected behavior changes, like, you know, leaving a room in a hurry um, or something like that. I, I'm sure a lot of us have done that. <laughs> um, smelling things that other people don't or not smelling things that other people do um, because, you uh, um, oh, it looks like we have another person because smell um, is really close to um, taste. It can lead to trouble eating or nausea. Um, if you are um, under responsive, um, you can have poor hygiene. Um, if you don't notice like body odor or um, bad breath, um, also issues with food safety. Um, it, you know, if you sniff the milk and you can't tell, is that sour? Is it not sour? Um, then you might move on to tasting it, um, which is less than ideal. Um, also avoidance, anxiety, and fatigue in environment with strong smells. Um, seeking out preferred smells. And again, you know, this is something we all do. Um, so it would be, you know, issues with sensory processing if this is excessive. Um, and I've worked with a lot of kids who are always smelling things to the point where they can't focus on their schoolwork and it's affecting social relationships and things like that. Um, also trouble differentiating sense. Um, so what helps? We'll go over practice first. So that graded exposure thing, um, but you know, be careful. Um, you don't wanna end up um, you know, sensitizing yourself to something, um, pairing um, challenging smells with um, something happy or enjoyable. Um, and one great way to do this is cooking. Like um, if you don't like the smell of cinnamon, but you really like cooking, have really fond memories of cooking with your grandma, that might be a way that you can expose yourself to the smell of cinnamon um, while kind of having the, the nice, happy distraction of cooking as well. Um, and cooking is great. I'll be talking a lot about cooking because it's a very sensory immersive experience. Um, gardening is similar, um, you know, going to a coffee shop, visiting a farm. There's lots of places that have like these rich um, sensory um, makeup to them. And then what helps um, if you're you know, you're in a situation and you're like, I can't cope. Um, so air fresheners, diffusers, aromatherapy. So that would be like taking one strong scent and blocking out maybe like a diversity of scents um, or using unscented um, cleaning and hygiene products. Um, masking. Um, when I first started giving these talks, uh, masks weren't really a thing yet. Um, but now, you know, pretty much any time you're in public, it's perfectly acceptable to wear a mask. So that's great for those of us with uh, smell sensitivities. Um, so masking, um, different masks block smells to different extents. You can kind of experiment and see what works best for you. Um, mouth breathing sometimes kind of works. Um, uh, if you um, are someone who like may, maybe the smell of food, even if it's kind of a good smell, makes you nauseous and not really hungry, um, eating in well-ventilated uh, environments like this lovely picnic going on over here, um, picnics are great, um, eating lunch outside at school, things like that. Um, if you are craving uh, sensory input, using scented materials um, in work, school, play, there's scented markers, scented erasers, um, there's playing with like different spices and food. Um, and if you're having trouble with hygiene, using other cues like visual cues, um, like post-it notes on your mirror, remember to brush your teeth, um, or remember to check your breath before going on a date, things like that. Up in this upper right-hand corner, there's a hygiene checklist, which looks like it's geared to kids, um, but it can just as easily be used for adults as well. And we're on to taste, um, where the primary sensory organ is on our tongue. Um, and so sensory processing issues with taste can look like being a picky eater. That makes sense. Um, general anxiety around food. Um, and this could actually, uh, you know, translate to um, having anxiety trying new foods because, again, the um, lack of predictability is hard. Um, or social situations that involve food could cause anxiety. Um, it can even contribute to an eating disorder. Um, so it can get quite serious. 
Um, someone who has issues with taste might gag, heave, or vomit easily. Um, and um, on the other side of things, um, if you're if you're an under responder or a, a sensory craver, you might seek out um, strong tasting foods. Um, and the other side of that is avoiding strong tasting foods. Um, so that and the seeking out strong tasting foods might um, include excessive use of condiments like salt, butter, hot sauce, um, lots of other spices. Um, sometimes, mostly in kids, you could see it, uh, and mostly in young kids, it might be um, excessive drooling. Um, that could be a sign of them having troubles uh, with uh, the sensory processing of taste. Um, and again, food safety issues. So if you bite into something and it's uh, you know, gone rotten. Um, hopefully you'd notice that and spit it out and not eat it. But if you don't really register that, that, um, sensory information, um, you might continue eating it and then you could get sick. So don't want that. So what can we do about it? So practicing gradual exposure, that's going to be a common thing for all of these. Um, it's important that if you're doing something that's kind of stressful, like trying new foods or eating a food you're not too sure if you're comfortable with, to do it in a stress-free environment. Um, so when you are, you know, going on a lunch interview, that is not necessarily the time to be very adventurous um, with trying new food or trying food that you're not really comfortable with. Um, it's really good um, for for kids, but again, adults too. Um, interacting food, interacting with food without pressure to eat. So, um, especially kids, again, because they have less control. Um, there's a lot of pressure to try everything on your plate, to finish your plate. You can't get up from the table until you're done. And kids can um, get really big anxiety about food from that, actually. Um, and, uh, to the point where, you know, they, they want nothing to do with food, won't even touch it. Um, and this is an extreme case, but it, it is something some OTs work with. So, um, interacting with food without any pressure. So like playing with your food, um, or here we see like a plastic tea party set where you can go through the motions, um, you know, the social aspects of having a tea party, but there's no food. It's all pretend. Um, so that's a way to get more comfortable with it more, more for kids. Um, and oh yeah, playing with your food also more for kids, but not exclusively. <laughs> There's no reason why adults can't play with your food as well. Um, and here we have cooking again. So if you're involved in the process of cooking your food, um, you might have a better relationship with it, less anxiety. Um, and then also the, um, taste test game. Um, so, you know, closing your eyes and having, um, you know, trying different things. And that can help with like discrimination or it can kind of be a fun way of confronting some of those more minor food anxieties. And then what helps um, in a compensatory um, way, um, if you can manage it, uh, whether even if you're too old for it, ordering off the kid's menu, things tend to be more plain. Um, and if you, on the other hand, feel like you constantly need to be eating, even if you're not hungry, but you feel the cravings, you feel the drive to eat, um, instead, chewing gum, sucking on candy can be really helpful, especially if there's strong flavors like this lovely peppermint. Um, if you're not a mint person and, um, for example, you really don't like brushing your teeth, um, you can use kids non-mint toothpaste. And I think they, they are starting to come out with some for adults. Um, you know, consult your dentist, but from what I hear, um, it, it's, you know, just as good to use non-mint toothpaste. Um, and that has been life-changing to a lot of people who I've talked to who had a lot of trouble brushing their teeth and it was because of the mint. So I just want everyone to know that that's an option. Um, ensuring food is vis visually appealing. Um, and smells good. That's kind of part of making the, the whole experience a pleasurable one. Um, and then if you are seeking that really strong tasting food and you find yourself adding a lot of butter um, or um, in my case, mayonnaise, that's, that's my vice. Um, instead, um, try and use some healthier spices um, that can help. Um, also, you know, if you, if you know that you can bite into something and not really be able to tell if it's safe or not using other cues, you know, inspect the food, um, you know, or look at expiration dates, things like that. Ask someone else, what do you think about this? It's been in the fridge for a while. <laughs> 
Um, also, um, I kind of already covered this, but eating um, safe foods in challenging situations. So again, when you're on a lunch interview, that's probably not so much the time um, to get to get uh, gutsy with what what you're eating. Oh, and I did not mean uh, for that pun. <laughs> Um, all right, we're on to vision, um, where the primary sensory organs are in the eyes. And what does that look like um, if there if there are problems there? Um, so seeking or avoiding um, bright light, bright colors, sharp contrasts. Um, and this this again isn't like if you um, you know don't like bright light, you can't go outside without sunglasses. That doesn't necessarily mean that you also can't stand bright colors. Um, um, and actually, in my case, so much of my wardrobe is bright colors, and I cannot stand sunny days. So there we go. Um, anxiety, fatigue, or spaciness. Um, if there is that bright light, those bright colors, or busy visual input. Um, I particularly think of this um, in like action movies, um, like haunted houses where there might be flashing lights um, or um, crowds. Crowds is a big trigger for a lot of people. And as you can imagine, there's a lot going on. So there's a lot our sensory systems have to cope with. Um, and that can look like difficulty concentrating in busy environments. Um, uh, it can also look like trouble tracking moving objects. So someone threw a ball to me, um, can I stand here and catch it or do I have to move to one side or the other to catch it? Um, or like, you know, if you're driving, um, is the car, you know, coming in my lane, like how quickly, um, and I need to make a decision based on this, um, losing things that are in plain view. Uh, that's basically one of my main hobbies. Um, poor hand-eye coordination, um, which can affect things like writing, um, like, other fine motor things like cutting, um, arts and crafts, um, sports, things like that. Um, oh, and video games. Um, difficulty or understanding, like comprehending and remembering visual instructions. And um, eye fatigue, pain, um, and even trouble reading. Um, headaches also sometimes can be from trouble processing visual information. Um, and this one was kind of a surprise to me and explained a lot. Um, of my childhood is trouble or fear of stairs, escalators, or moving walkways. Um, so that might be something that some of you relate to and never quite knew why. Um, it can be a sensory processing issue. Um, and there's tons of really, really fun things that we can do to practice, things that help. Um, so a lot of sports, um, puzzles, um, uh, like crossword puzzles or like maze puzzles like here. Um, hobbies that have to do with vision, like photography, um, video games. Um, there's also vision therapy. Um, that's what this, uh, cute kid is doing up here. Um, and, um, I think OTs can do that. Um, and some vestibular PTs, and then sometimes there's people who are like a, a certified vision therapist. Um, and you can usually find who those people are through Google or um, for, from asking your, um, whoever follows you for, for vision. Um, and then some types of vestibular therapy also will address, um, practicing to, um, have better visual processing. Um, and there's also a lot that helps, um, to, um, compensate for difficult, um, issues that doesn't involve practicing. Um, so wearing dark sunglasses, hats, visors, staying in the shade if, um, sunlight um, is not something you enjoy. Um, also keeping indoor lights low or off. Um, uh, in busy environments, narrowing your focus. Um, so an example of that would be like going grocery shopping and holy cow, there's so much going on there to pay attention to. It can get very overwhelming very quickly. So, um, what I, um, recommend people do is kind of like stop, take a breath, look in front of you. Okay. What is it? Okay. It's SpaghettiOs. Do I want SpaghettiOs? Yes or no. And then go on to the next thing. Um, and having like a list or like a strategy, like starting at one end of the store and working your way through can also be helpful. Um, having, um, uh, like kind of soothing, um, let's see, I think there's another person who wants to be let in. Oh yeah. Um, so also having soothing colors in your living environment, um, 
I actually have um, this um, projector, I guess you would call it, in my room, and it is absolutely lovely. Uh, it puts me right to sleep. Um, so having like a, a comfortable level of light and decoration in your workspace can be really helpful. Um, so it'll have feedback. Mom, can you please mute yourself? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My mom's uh, on the call too. Um, uh, let's see. And then if you get overwhelmed, if you can find a safe place or, you know, if you're with someone else, if they can kind of watch out for you where you can, you know, get away from it all, close your eyes or, you know, focus on something far away and kind of reset. Um, if you are someone who is seeking or craving visual um, input, um we you probably have heard about like fidget spinners or or various like tactile um fidgets but you can have fidgets that have a lot to do with vision too so this projector is an example of that um also like things like snow globes um which you can make yourself um, or buy at the store um and then if you have trouble um understanding um visual input like reading you can also do audiobooks or verbal instructions um and um, if you're in school or at work um your computer screen or worksheets can be adapted um to make it easier for you so for example here um like a line piece of paper is easier for a lot of people to use and write on than a blank piece of paper um and there's all sorts of adaptive um ways um like adding different line width um and things like that that can be really helpful um there's a, a ton of assistive technology um for people with low vision and sometimes it might also be helpful for um people if they have to limit their um how often their eyes are open or what type of um technology they can take in um you can find that through your um local low vision um, there's clinics or organizations, um, and even though they're for people with low vision, which is like a primary, um, primary visual issue with your eye or your, um, brain, sometimes they are able to help people with, um, visual sensory processing issues too. All right, and on to hearing, um, and the primary sensory organ for that, you probably already know, in our ears. Um, and this can look like, um, or problems with this can look like, um, I say selective hearing loss because in my experience, most of the time, it's not so much selective hearing loss um, as just sensory processing issues um, with auditory information. Um, can also take a long time to respond when spoken to. Um, if you're extra sensitive, you can hear things others don't um, or you know, vice versa, not hear things that other people do. Be easily distracted by sounds. Um, you can be easily distressed by sounds that are loud, irregular, or unexpected. Um, and actually what I don't have on there is that um, it doesn't have to be any of those things to be distressful. Um, some people, um, just the sound of like, you know, electricity, um, like the buzzing of an air conditioner or the buzzing of a fan, even though it's kind of low and um, constant, it can also be distressful. So, um, you know, you don't have to fit one particular box. <laughs> Um, trouble understanding where a sound came from. Um, like I said earlier, that's like, you know, someone's calling me from the other room, but which other room? Is that in front of me, behind me? I don't know where to turn my head to look at the person who's talking. Um, afraid or avoidant of things um, like toilets flushing, power tools, or vacuums. Um, and I was like, I was kind of surprised, like working with a lot of kids and parents, they say like, my kid has um, a public restroom phobia. Um, which totally can happen, but usually when we kind of investigate it, it has to do with how noisy the toilets are when they're flushing, that we can't always control when they flush, if they have um, sensors that don't work well, um, we can't control when other people flush the toilet, and then um, hand dryers, while they're great for the environment, um, I think, citation needed, um, they are very loud, so um, this is kind of a, a good way, like a good way of thinking to really look um, like what what is the cause of anxiety? Um, again, thanks uh, for the people who just joined us. Welcome. Um, all right, uh, seeking out certain kinds of sounds um, or making excessive amounts of noise. Um, I think anyone who has ever worked with kids um, can can relate to this. Um, you know, and there there's some kids who are even noisier than others. Like, 
my brother, when he goes up and down the stairs, oh my gosh, he can wake the whole household. <laughs> um, it sounds like someone uh, needs to be put on mute. It's about, um, it's a lecture about um, sensory processing issues in EDS. Hi. Uh, would AKA, you, mind? you know, like misophonia. Would you it's mind going on mute? iPhone too? Anyway. All right, hopefully someone else can do that. I don't, I can't see the screen right now. Thank you. Uh, anyways, uh, what helps? Um, so engaging um, with sound. Um, so listening to audiobooks, um, music, podcasts, things like that. Um, again, if you're in a busy environment, picking out one sound out of the din, um, that's kind of a, a common mindfulness um, tactic too. Um, uh, safe and supported and you know not forced gradual exposure to sound rich environments um, as long as you know it feels comfortable um, practicing reflective listening or other communication strategies if you find that you're having trouble following conversation or um, yeah talking with other people um, listening games like simon says um, again mostly for kids but not exclusively anyone can do things like that um, and there's also specific um, auditory processing therapy. Um, there's like certain curriculums and certain therapists who um, this is like their whole thing that they do. Um, and some of the names of those curriculums are interactive metronome and the listening program. Um, there's not a huge amount of evidence about a lot of these things um, yet because they're fairly new, but um, anecdotally, I've worked with lots of people who have used these and um, the clients and the therapists have raving reviews. So I wanted to put that on here that that's an option you might look for. And then what helps if you're in the moment and you can't stand it um, and you just need some help? Um, so muting things like um, earmuffs, headphones, earplugs, um, being in control of sound. Um, and so here in the upper right, we see this, this woman um, on public transit and she has her earphones in. And that's kind of a way of controlling a very uncontrolled um, environment. So she can block out the other noises with a sound that she um, chooses and she chooses the volume and she chooses whether she's listening to pop or rap or a podcast. Um, so that sense of control can be really important. Um, uh, if, you know, if you need to concentrate, it's good to be in a supportive environment um, where it's your preferred level of sound, whether that's blasting music or a complete quiet. Um, white noise for sleep can be really helpful. Um, if you're someone who has trouble falling asleep because they hear noises or kind of startles from sleep, like if someone walks by your room, um, uh, if family, friends, teachers, whoever, you know, need your attention can like flag you down, um, with a visual cue, um, or, um, you know, say something like, like, you know, your name, are you listening? Okay. You know, now we can, now we can have the conversation. Um, and I used to have eye contact here because that used to be thought of as a way that you can communicate, um, or the best way to communicate that you are paying attention, but, this is not true because not um, everyone is comfortable with eye contact. And also, um, as you can probably attest to, someone can be looking you right in the eyes and not be paying attention to a word you're saying. So I don't have that on there anymore. Um, subtitles for movie and TV are huge. Um, and one example I give is um, I was completely obsessed with the show Buffy the Vampire Slayer as a teenager. Like, I'm thinking I've watched every single episode dozens of times. And recently I did a rewatch and I used subtitles and I was amazed because I think I missed a third of the show and I had no idea. Um, so yeah, subtitles are really, really helpful. Um, and if you um, are kind of in the sensory craving um, or, or your child or someone you know, having appropriate time to fulfill that need is really important. So like a lot of preschools will have music time, time for outdoor play with outdoor voices, clapping games, things like that. Because um, remember, lack of um, the sensory input you need can be just as hard as too much or the wrong kind. Um, so for all those sensory cravers, it's important that, you know, we don't forget them and we, we make sure that they have opportunities too. 
All right, there goes my beeping again. Um, all right, touch. So I don't actually have the primary sensory receptors on this slide because I thought this is much more interesting. This kind of shows um, like the proportion of the brain um, that is processing information from these different parts. So um, as you can imagine, like a pinprick on your lip will feel a lot different than a pinprick on like maybe your mid low back um, just because of how things are um, taken in and processed. And um, this uh, sensory system of touch includes things like pressure, temperature, vibration, and um, things like sharp pain, like pin, pin prick pain, or like burns um, to your skin, things like that. All right, um, and this is a tough one for a lot of people. So this is kind of a, a busy slide. I apologize for that, but I wanted to make sure I covered all of this. So things like um, avoiding um, getting your hands sticky or messy um, or oily, things like that. Um, on the other hand, failing to notice that if you do have uh, messy hands or food on your face or something like that. Um, avoidance of walking on certain textures too. This is also something we see a lot in little kids, but um, it's not something that you necessarily grow out of. Um, avoidance or dislike of a lot of hygiene activities. This is something I do a lot um, of work with things like brushing hair and teeth, taking a shower. This can be like really challenging for a lot of people. Um, having strong preferences and how clothes feel um, or how much of the body they cover, um, how they fit, whether they're tight or loose. Um, being over or under sensitive um, to temperature or being touched. Um, appraising food based on texture. Um, for some people, the texture of the food is actually more important than the taste, uh, which is completely valid. Um, but if you have, you know, really, if you're really in tune with the texture of food, you might, you might have um, dislike of certain foods that doesn't make sense to other people and you might have to explain things and, you know, that's not always fun. Uh, but again, totally valid, just different. Um, feeling, oh, we already did that feeling to notice uh, messy hands, um, strong preference for light touch or deep pressure. So that would be kind of the difference between a light touch might be tickling. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Um, or like a big bear hug, um, like with that really like squeeze deep pressure. Um, then um, anxiety or fatigue or just feeling overwhelmed if you're in situations where people might brush up against you that's that light touch um, or bump into you which might be a bit more deep pressure um and not just people it could be animals um you know if you're if you're clumsy it might be running into stationary objects even um this can look like difficulty with fine motor um difficulty distinguishing textures so like how sharp is this knife um, you know, I can't tell, is it sharp or is it dull? Um, you know, before I go to cut an apple or something. <laughs> um, difficulty with personal space, um, knowing, you know, how close or how far um, you are to other people um, and wearing clothes inappropriate for the temperature. Um, and for this last one, I would just like to know who decides because in my mind, it's completely appropriate to wear flip-flops in winter in the middle of Boston, but I've been told that that is inappropriate and like, you know, a safety issue and frostbite and all of that. So I don't know, maybe I'm skeptical about that part. Um, what helps? We have cooking again. I think I have cooking for almost all of these. I love prescribing cooking. Um, it's a it's a great activity and a lot of people really like it. Um, so hobbies and activities that involve getting messy, um, not just cooking, but like pottery, gardening, things like that. Um, if you have trouble um, distinguishing different textures or you just want to kind of practice that sense, you can close your eyes and feel different things either around you, although be careful if you're moving with your eyes closed, maybe that's a buddy activity. Um, texture scavenger hunts. Um, those were really popular when I worked in the pediatric um, uh, therapy clinic. Um, dress up games are really, really good for kids who have trouble with different um, textures or tightness of clothes because you're pairing it with a fun activity of make believe um, or a game. And um, when the kid puts something on, they know that they can take it right off, um, you know, right away um, or in a few minutes and trade it for for something else. And so that, you know, gives them that sense of control that they're not stuck 
and a, you know, a, a skirt with crinoline, which I think crinoline is a crime against humanity. But if I was playing dress up, I might be convinced to put on a dress, a uh, crinoline skirt. Um, and then um, there's also a specialized therapy called desensitization or sensory retraining therapy. This is usually done by OTs or PTs. Um, and usually it's in the context of you have like an injury to your nerve. Maybe you had like carpal tunnel surgery or something like that. And now just the air against your hand drives you crazy. Um, so this is like a very evidence-based and very rigorous, actually. Um, it's it's hard for the patient um, a program that you can do to kind of like retrain yourself to be able to um, cope with with things like, you know, the air on your skin or, you know, the brushing of clothes against your skin, things like that. Um, and then there's a lot that you can also do, you know, in the moment compensatory. Um, so basically being comfortable in the clothes you're in, it, you know, if fashion, um, you know, or dress codes or things like that are a factor, um, you know, you definitely have to have to abide by that. Um, but in general, like the older I get, the more I'm picking out clothes based on what's comfortable. Um, so you can do that many different ways. It can be in like the specific items you choose. You can use fabric softener by use clothes. If you don't like tags in your clothes, cut them out. There's no law, you know, that says you have to walk around with um, tags that are bugging you all the time. Um, this is actually a newer one for me. I learned from my friend who has a service dog, um, that they can be trained to do, um, like boundary guarding. So like in crowds, they'll, um, kind of put themselves in between you and other people. So you're not as likely to get bumped into, um, and then they can provide that deep pressure. That's kind of like a big bear hug, um, by crawling on your lap or your chest. Um, you know, just as if we needed more reasons to love dogs. They're absolutely wonderful. Um, also like wearing gloves during messy activities. Um, I know some people wear gloves every time they do the dishes and cause you know, they don't like that loppy food or the feeling of water on their hands and that's fine. Um, you know, again, there's no law that says you have to be miserable when you're doing daily activities. Um, if you don't like using a vibrating toothbrush and so you stop brushing your teeth, um, you know, try a non-vibrating toothbrush and that might be better tolerated. And also, you know, things like hair detangler, um, you know, basically what can you do to make yourself more comfortable? Um, you can use non-tactile uh, cues for um, this appropriate dress, whatever that is, um, cleanliness and personal space. So for example, even though I'm comfortable wearing flip-flops in Boston winter, maybe I look at the weather that day and see that the temperature is negative five degrees. And I think, well, I guess I'll wear shoes today. Um, uh, deep pressure and heavy work. So, um, like, you know, carrying in groceries, things like that can help, um, to kind of offset, um, uh, issues with, um, you know, touch that you're experiencing. Um, and this is something that comes up a lot in relationships because people have different boundaries and, um, likes and dislikes when it comes to touch. So it's really important to, um, have open communication with in your like platonic and romantic relationships. So you make sure that, you know, you're a good match. Everyone's needs, um, you know, is being met and the boundaries are respected. Proprioception. So now we're, we've um, gone kind of from the, the usual ones that you've probably heard a lot about um, since childhood. And we're going into um, these ones that might be more new. Um, so proprioception, the primary sensory organs are in and around our joints. Um, and since we are hypermobile, uh, for the most part, that is why a lot of us have trouble with proprioception. So um, this can result in poor posture and body alignment. Um, and that's not just, you know, am I hunched at the computer? Um, but also, you know, I need to go kick a ball. And what does my body need to do? How much force do I need to use? You know, am I passing the ball to someone three feet in front of me, or am I trying to kick it all the way down the soccer field and score a goal? Um, resting in end range of joints. Um, so like pretzel sitting, um, I think, I think we're kind of famous for, um, like I've, I've had clients, I do telehealth and some, will, some people will literally sit with their knee, like at level with their ear. Uh, and yeah, I know like that does, that does feel comfortable. That does feel good, but it is not good for us. Um, so even though it might feel good in the moment, um, that's, that's a sign that, 
um, you might need to get sensory input some other way um, that's more safe. Um, uh, using too much or too little force, I kind of mentioned that um, with the body alignment, um, clumsiness, uh, frequent injuries, um, a feeling of physical insecurity. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons why we do things like rest and end range of motion is because we're not getting the right feedback if we're sitting, um, you know, normal <laughs> um, or, or in, you know, good non-extreme posture. And because we're not getting that input, our body can kind of be like, well, I don't know where I am in space. Um, and as you can, you know, imagine like that's something that happens in free fall. And if you're in free fall, um, you're in danger. So, um, so it can be common to be in like a safe environment and um, not feel safe or not feel secure. Um, you can, uh, because of this, you might seek other sensory input um, to compensate, um, not just that pretzel sitting, but, you know, fidgeting, changing position, um, needing like tactile fidget toys, things like that. Um, because, um, if you, if your body posture alignment and movement, um, isn't working quite right, you might be expending more energy, um, when you move. So that can cause fatigue. Um, I already said frequent injuries, um, and, um, all of this combined can kind of lead to avoiding physical activity. Looks like I have some more people entering. Uh, if you just joined us, welcome. Um, and this is kind of a unique sense um, where the line between what is practice and what is compensatory, so what is helping me now and what is helping me in the future, the line is kind of blurred, so I just um, combined everything, um, because usually if you're doing, um, you know, if you're, if you're engaging in this sense, it's kind of both things, um, so we'll talk about what's practice and compensatory, um, so one thing, um, so the first two things on here, I have maybe um, after it, and that's because research is really mixed on this, whether compression garments, kinesio tape, things like that, um, actually um, help with proprioception. And um, it, it's hard because the research isn't quite as supportive as I would like before I recommend something, but anecdotally and personally, it can be very, it can seem very helpful. So I say, if it's working, that's good enough. You know, that's great. If it works, do it. Um, you know, some sometimes this um the search for evidence is kind of at odds to just kind of practically looking at something and be like, I don't care if research says that this may or may not work. It works for me and that's good enough. Um uh weight bearing activities, um, weighted vest and blankets are great, but be mindful of your joints. Um, I've heard of a lot of people with EDS who get weighted blankets and they love them, but like if they sleep on their side with them, their collarbones might shift out. So please be careful, um, stomping, crashing, pushing, pulling. Um, but again, please be careful of your joints, um, and doing these things with play equipment or obstacle courses. And I, obstacle courses are one of my favorite things to do with kids. I recommend that to all parents. Um, it makes me so happy to see, um, you know, when I go over to my friend's house and their kids are doing obstacle course courses through the house where they're climbing on and under and through things. Um, it's wonderful. I feel so happy for their little nervous systems. Um, and, you know, kind of for, for kids, but more for adults, we're more likely to do things like gym activities, um, like heavy work, carrying heavy things, um, or like resistance exercises with TheraBands, things like that. But again, can't stress this enough, please be careful of your joints and make sure that you're cleared to do these type of activities. Um, this is just kind of another thing, illustrating different ways that you can engage your proprioception. Be careful, probably not wrestling, um, you know, probably not crashing, um, you know, please use common sense and, and don't hurt yourself in the name of seeking proprioception. All right, now onto vestibular. Um, so we were talking about where our body is in space. Now we're talking about how our head is moving in space, um, you know, upside down, right side up, um, going forward, backwards, acceleration, things like that. If you have trouble with that, that can look like um, either aversion or affinity towards um, theme park rides, playground equipment, spinning, rocking, um, things like skateboarding, bike riding. Um, there's something called gravitational insecurity. Um, and um, that's if someone wants to basically have like two feet firmly on the ground. 
Um, my dog actually has this. Uh, she might be the only dog officially diagnosed with it because I diagnosed her. But if I pick her up, she does not like it. She gets stiff and she like splays out her leg and she is not comfortable until she's back on the ground. So apparently it can happen in dogs and people. Um, impulsive or overly cautious movements can happen. Um, postural instability or abnormal posture. Um, and this is a little bit less kind of like, am I hunched? Like, what is my spine doing? And it might be more like, um, you know, can I walk in a straight line without falling over? Or um, some people may just kind of exist with like their head tilted to one side, um, which I can't do because I'm fused, um, but you can use your imagination. Um, strong desire to be moving um, or sedentary um, excessively. You know, again, some amount is normal of wanting, you know, having a preference. Um, prone to things like motion sickness, dizziness, nausea, um, and difficulties with um, vestibular processing are magnified when you take out the eyes from the equation. Um, so like, you know, if you are walking into a movie theater and when you were out in the lobby, you were walking fine, normal gait, no one would notice anything. You walk into the dark, your eyes haven't adjusted yet, so you can't see and suddenly you're falling into a wall. Um, and that can also happen when people like take off glasses or contacts that they're used to. So what helps practicing, engaging, um, eye tracking exercises or head movement exercises if you are cleared to do so? Um, it's definitely not something that someone with like cervical hypermobility, for example, should do. Um, uh, rocking, swaying, bending, anything that's getting your head moving in relation to gravity. Um, and some there's some like gym and um, playground equipment that can do this. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention. So for, for this area of practice for the vestibular system, I always warn people that this is a very, very dramatic system. Um, so a little tiny bit, like just slight eye tracking exercises can be enough to make someone dizzy or nauseous for hours or even more than a day. So um, start slow, um, you know, maybe with the guide of a therapist um, and you know, if you're doing that um, graded exposure, do that also very slowly. Um, there's specialized therapy, but uh, both PTs and OTs can do vestibular or balance therapy. And sometimes a vision therapy actually do incorporate um, the vestibular system as well. And here are some fun things that you can do as a kid or as an adult. Although um, I would hesitate to recommend jumping or bouncing, <laughs> uh, that might be hard on the joints. Um, okay. And what helps? Um, so especially if you have like gravitational insecurity or balance issues, keeping more points of your body in contact with fixed objects. So for example, I learned from uh, my vestibular therapist that when I'm going down the stairs, instead of just putting my hand on the arm rail, I put my hand on my whole arm on the arm rail as I'm going down. So I have more surface area in contact with that, that steady unfixed object. Um, there's motion sickness aids like um, medication and wristbands, but um, check with your doctor first. Um, Dramamine especially um, uh, can be pretty pretty potent with a lot of side effects and can interact with a lot of medications. Um, so even, even though it's over the counter, um, it shouldn't be underestimated. Um, being in control of the movement. So if you get car sick, um, if you are someone who can safely drive, being the driver might help. Um, keeping your eyes on fixed points, not just your body as you're moving. Um, if you get overwhelmed, um, just like everywhere else, closing your eyes and being still in a safe place um, uh, and, you know, taking breaks um, and taking breaks in general is really helpful. Um, I find sometimes like a three to five minute break can give you like 20, 30, 40 more minutes of comfort or um, engaging in whatever activity it was. Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of the break taking when you need it um, and even before you need it. Um, and then participating in activities that give you vestibular input if that's what you feel like your body needs. So like dancing, there's a picture or a silhouette of someone doing ice skating, um, dance, I think I already said dancing, rocking chairs, swings, those are all great. All right, and we're on to our last sense. Um, so this is interoception or interoception, depending on who you ask. Um, and because it's relatively new, not everyone agrees what this includes. Like some people, for example, might say it includes hormones and how they affect you. And some people may say it doesn't, um, but I like to be inclusive. So I say, you know, it all 
it all um, is part of this sense. So th these are um, all things that like what's going on inside of the body. Um, and that includes things like emotions. Um, so if you have trouble with this, it can look like forgetting to eat, drink, or go to the bathroom. Um, these explosive emotions, because, um, you know, someone might be in a crowd and they might say, oh, I'm getting overwhelmed. Okay, I'm going to, um, you know, go to this, go a few streets over from this festival and take a break. Okay, I feel better. Now I'm going to go back in. I feel more regulated and ready, you know, to interact with my friends versus someone who doesn't notice that they're getting overwhelmed. They're fine. They're fine. They're fine. They're fine. They're not fine. They're having a meltdown. Um, and it's, it's not that they, you know, did something wrong. It's just that, um, they have trouble processing the sensory information that's telling them, Hey, you're kind of getting overwhelmed. They want to take a break. Um, someone could also not notice when it's too hot or too cold, um, which could actually be a, a safety issue. Um, uh, difficulty noticing or describing or localizing, um, pain or just other symptoms. Um, this is really important, um, I, you know, because, a lot of doctors we go to say, rate your pain on a scale of one to 10. What is the quality of the pain? Where is it located exactly? Is it burning? Is it um, aching? Is it stabbing? Um, and that's a lot. And often it's um, very difficult to um, really sense that and then to be able to verbally express it as well. Um, also being able to notice um, and describe the physical aspects of emotion. So that's like, you know, your face flushing, if you're embarrassed or butterflies in your stomach, you might feel the butterflies and think, I don't, you know, and, and not be able to say, oh, it's because I'm nervous. Um, it, it might be like the physical sensation is completely detached um, from the emotion that's related to it. Um, and then difficulty distinguishing between different types of sen um, internal sensory information, like I feel off, but is it because I'm hungry? Is it because I'm in pain? Is it because I'm tired? I'm not really sure. Um, and also feeling discomfort greater in intensity than expected, um, but also less um, in intensity than expected. Um, you know, some people can break a bone um, and and be like, oh yeah, I guess it kind of hurts. And, you know, maybe they take a few days to go to the doctor because they're like, I don't know, like, yeah, it's kind of discomfort when a lot of people, if they broke a bone, like that would feel and be an emergency because of how much pain they were in. So what helps practice, uh, you know, engaging with your emotions, engaging um, with your sensations and trying to figure out, you know, cause and effect and putting names to things. Um, this is an emotion wheel, which I think was initially um, created um, by um, autistics for autistics um, to help, you know, describe and, um, uh, communicate emotions, but I think it's really useful, um, you know, for everyone. Um, uh, just kind of like getting getting the different names um, and kind of the different categories of emotions. Um, practicing that can be helpful. Um, mindfulness is really helpful, especially with attention to internal sensations. Um, and again, that safe, comfortable, graded exposure. Um, kind of less so for this sensory system because, um, you know, if you're hungry, you probably want to eat. If you have to go to the bathroom, it's probably best to go to the bathroom. So, um, you know, un unless you're having like major challenges and working with uh, a therapist specifically on that, you, you may less need um, to do graded exposure and more just respond to what your body is telling you it needs. Um, what helps? So many things. Um, so performing check-ins with your body. Um, and sometimes if that's hard to do, um, set timers to remember, um, you know, kind of like sit a second and say, am I hungry? Am I thirsty? Do I need to go to the bathroom? Am I feeling overwhelmed? If that's not something you usually notice, sometimes just directing your attention there um, can be enough. Um, having external structure or other cues um, to help for things like uh, healthy eating, drinking. So um, like here, like having um, healthy food out accessible so that you can visually see it and that might remind you to eat. Um, and, you know, kind of the flip side of that is um, instead of having um, unhealthy food out and easily accessible, you kind of put that maybe in the back of the cupboard, put barriers between you and, and the food that's not gonna, um, you know, do good things to your body. Um, uh, friends and family can help remind you 
Um, and it depends. So in my family, um, we've communicated about this and it's usually pretty okay to say, Ooh, I think someone's hangry. <laughs> um, and then the other person goes like, Oh, yep, that's totally right. Or maybe like not hangry, but definitely tired. Um, so, you know, other, other people in your life can also check in with you. You can check in with other people, um, if done respectfully. Um, if you have trouble describing your symptoms or pain, and you know, you're going to an important appointment, you can write them down ahead of time, um, or, you know, at least kind of check in with yourself and think about it um, ahead of time. So you're not caught off guard at the appointment. Um, and just kind of like with a lot of things, be kind to yourself. Like when you're uncomfortable, when you're anxious, when you're depressed, when you're in pain, like be kind to yourself, you know, do things that make you more comfortable, um, that help you get your energy to where it needs to be. Um, and there can also be cognitive strategies that might be something that you work on through like self-help or with a, um, a psychotherapist. Um, and, you know, no one's suggesting that you can think your way out of pain um, unless you're like, I don't know, maybe a master at meditation or some, someone could do that. But in general, that's not that's not what you're after. You're more um, uh, changing like how you think about the pain, um, like, oh, my stomach hurts. It's the end of the world. I'm probably dying you know, this is the worst thing ever versus my stomach hurts. I wonder if it's what I ate, you know, um, I've had this pain before and it wasn't an emergency then. So it might not be an emergency now. What is this pain trying to tell me? Is it useful pain? Things like that. Um, so we're done with the sensory systems, but I couldn't, um, leave out my very favorite thing to talk about when it comes to sensory processing, which are sensory hacks. Um, so you can you can tell that I started doing this about a decade ago um, because I think hacks were, was all the rage. Every website was like 10 hacks to do whatever. So I call these sensory hacks. Um, sensory input can be really powerful um, to control our mood, energy, and comfort. We've talked already about a lot of different ways um, that it can have these powerful um, effects on us. But we've kind of been talking more about um, how it affects us negatively. So instead, we're going to shift the narrative and talk about, um, you know, how we can use this information positively. So we can think of different sensory input as being calming, um, energizing, and again, both, neither, it depends, are all also valid. Um, and so, you know, as you, as you go off into your life after this, um, start noticing how you feel um, and what is making you feel that way. And, um, you can write it down, you can journal or just keep track in your head. Um, like, oh, when I, you know, um, bit into a lemon, like that made me wake up really fast. That was energizing, um, versus when I drink hot chocolate, that kind of makes me sleepy and warm and comfortable. Um, so take note of this. And then maybe the next time you're at work and it's three o'clock and you still have a few hours to go and you're exhausted and you have some sour candy. That might be a good time to pop in some sour candy and get a little energy boost. Um, and what I call this is um, uh, this knowledge um, is building your sensory toolbox. So these are strategies that you can use in daily life. Um, and just briefly, um, there are things, you know, even though everyone is an individual and different, um, you know, people react differently to the same type of sensory input. There are things that are like in general tend to be calming and generally tend to be energizing. So I wanted to have those on here. Things that are expected, smooth, mild, if you're in control, um, all of that, that tends to be calming versus things that are energizing are things that are unexpected and vibrant and varied and are, are not under your control. Um, and we talk kind of earlier about that, you know, not under your control being a bad thing. But, um, you know, if you are wanting to to get pumped up um, before, you know, a, a basketball game or something, it might be a good time to listen to some like crazy um, remix that you haven't heard before, um, you know, with lots of different shifting in tempos and, and um, like types of music. Um, so there's that. So um, because I don't want you, um, to, you know, to just leave you with everything I said, and then, you know, everyone goes off and, you know, you probably forgot, forget a lot of this. Um, I wanted to leave you with something, um, to kind of revisit this if, if you're interested. So I have a kids and a teens slash young adult slash adult workbook, 
Um, and the link to that should have been in an email, um, either the same one that led you um, to this talk today or, or one that was uh, right before that. Um, so I have, uh, it's kind of more of a coloring workbook for kids. Um, and the goal of that um, is kind of less about getting into detail and more just opening a dialogue um, with kids to get them thinking about how they feel in relation to different sensory information. Um, and then the sensory workbook for teens, and it says young adults, but really for adults too, um, kind of um, recaps basically a lot of what I've talked about today and then has um, things like this here where you can um, uh, work on that sensory toolbox in a way that where you're like writing it down and being really purposeful about it. Um, so hopefully you can you can check those out. Um, you can just print them out from, um, it's a Google Doc, so you can print it out from there, or you can make a copy and save it to your drive um, and edit it, um, you know, if you need it like bigger, bigger font or different colors or anything like that. All right, um, so here are my sources, uh, which, you know, if you're interested, you can look back on later. Um, and that's that's all I have. So time for uh, questions and or a sensory break. I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen so that I can see everyone, I think, once I figure out how to do this. Let's see. I don't normally use Zoom. I use I use a different thing for. Oh, here we go. Stop share the big red button. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, I don't know how you do questions. Um, do you moderate them or should I um, go back through, look through the chat? Um, we tend to moderate them. Um, so people will kind of raise hands and then that way we can give different turns to different people. So we're not getting five for one person while there's 10 other people waiting. Okay. Um, so if people can use the raise hand feature, um, if you want to ask a verbal question, if you want me to read a question for you, um, feel free to put that in the chat. I think people are looking for your email address, Emily. Um, hmm. I don't know if you're able to write that into the chat as a yeah. message to everyone. That'd be great. Let me do that. Um, and then I see, let's see, a hand here, but it doesn't have that, just the initial J. Let's see. Um, hold on one second. Hi. Um, yeah. So I have a question about. Um, how does this really inter interact with like migraine? Because I find that sound is always stressful, but sometimes it's definitely a real migraine trigger and it's kind of hard to tell which is which. Yeah. Um, and then um, also differentiating like CCI versus other things. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that, it's hard because everything is kind of related. So um, the migraine is going to cause certain um, things in your body to happen where you're going to become more sensitive to these things. Um, and it just kind of, it shifts how your body processes things. And sometimes that's like, you know, the, the primary um, uh, sensory organ. So for example, um, you know, if you have your sympathetic nervous system is activated from dysautonomia and your pupils are big, um, you go out into the sun and you can't stand it. Whereas maybe some other time when you're not so sympathetic and your pupils constrict to light, you can stand it. Um, so it's really, um, that's why I really encourage people to, to not stop, um, and start at sensory processing. It should be part of the conversation. Um, but it should also be understood that it's in a greater context of things like migraines and CCI. Um, and, and sometimes it's important to tease out, you know, if you're trying to find like, what is the primary thing that I can tackle that will help with the system or symptom. And sometimes it's important to, you, you know, how can I be comfortable? How can I do symptom management? You know, aside, you know, if I don't have a diagnosis or I don't know exactly what's causing it, what can I do to feel better right now? Um, so it's kind of a, a messy combination of all the above. Also, um, do you have any recommendations for people who have issues with sound, but who can't really wear headphones or literally anything touching? Good question. And that, that is, um, that's actually one of the most asked things on my pediatric um, therapy boards where, where us OTs uh, discuss things. That's, that's really hard. Um, you know, maybe if you can try and slowly work up to being able to tolerate that. 
Um, but otherwise, um, you know, this is also hard, but seeing if you can be more in control of your environment so that it's, it's more supportive for you. Um, and if you can't do that, um, you know, having rest breaks or preparing ahead of time, making sure, you know, you're hydrated, you're, you know, not hungry, um, things like that. So, you know, it kind of gets like a little less and less effective, but there's, you still have some control. There's still some things you can do, but unfortunately no great answer for that. And then last short question. Um, okay. Are you guys looking into like eustachian tube issues with regards to sensory processing as a, a thing to check for? Um, so I, I am not, that is something I would refer to refer out to, um, like sometimes when someone has really, um, severe or stubborn, um, issues with, you know, auditory, uh, processing, I would refer them to an ENT, um, or sometimes even their, their primary doctor. So that's something that I would more think like a, um, like someone who does, um, like focuses on auditory processing, um, or, or a doctor, um, would, work on. And I'm, I'm sure there's people talking about it. I'm sure there's research going on, but um, that's definitely out of, out of my area of expertise. Thanks for the question. See, it looks like uh, Sophie might have a question. Hi. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know, so for people that just don't understand that this is really painful for us and they just say, hey, you know what? Just buck up, buttercup. You're just being too weak. Do you have any tips besides like saying, oh yeah, it's like a migraine? Because sometimes it's a little less, but they just don't understand that it's all too much and you need to get away. Just tips yeah. I think it's, um, you know, if you know the person well, kind of coming up with um, a metaphor that maybe is more accessible to them. Because um, like you said, not everyone has had a migraine. It's not always... Um, you know, as severe as a migraine, but um, kind of like meeting them where they're at and explaining it in a way that they understand. Um, but one thing I, I also, I always tell my clients is that we can't control someone else's reaction. So we can have the most amazing put together, um, you know, speech or elevator pitch about something. We can describe things in the exact right way, um, if there is such a thing, and the person cannot be receptive. And unfortunately, you know, we, there's nothing we can do about that. We can be persistent. We can speak up about our needs. Um, you know, we can, you know, even rehearse if it's something, um, you know, if rehearsing um, will help or something we can write down if we're not so, so gifted um, with uh, being articulate in those type of situations. Um, but yeah, it really, really comes down to it's kind of a team effort. And if the other person isn't playing on the team, unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do. Um, but I, I do feel like most people, if they're willing to be receptive, do kind of understand metaphors. Um, you know, you can, um, a, a lot of people for some reason find talking about kids less threatening. Um, so like, you know, have you ever known a kid who, who gets really afraid of loud noises or even like like I talked a little bit here about like dogs or cats or you know when when you're not talking about um you know someone in their peer group sometimes people are more receptive and you can say like oh yeah my dog you know cowers absolutely cowers and goes out of their mind with fireworks and you can say yeah that's what my brain is telling me to do when I hear a loud noise and it takes a lot of energy to not go cower in the closet um and so that can be something that's more relatable and, and more effective. Um, but, uh, you know, your my, mileage may vary and it's all kind of an adventure. <laughs> Thanks. Let's see, I'll you know, open up the chat and see if there's anything. Just scroll all the way up to top. Oh, it looks like maybe there was some technical problems. Were, was everyone able to see slides while I was talking? Okay. Um, well, because it's a recording, then hopefully, hopefully if you had trouble seeing the slides, you can go back and look at those. Let's see. I'll, I'll go through and read these.
Um, I think the workbooks were sent in an email. Um, uh, maybe Heather can can confirm um, where you can access those. Yeah, they're um, they're on our website, ORDS.org. Um, Deb posted that in the chat. Um, there's some links on the calendar to the workbooks. Um, and then they were also sent out um, via MailChimp for anyone that's um, on our mailing list or email list. Um, they would have gotten an email with those links sent as well. So can check your promotions or spam or social uh, sections of your email because sometimes that's where the big emails go. <laughs> they don't end up in the inbox that you're familiar with looking at. Um, if no one else has a question, I have one just about like, you know, is there a relationship between people that are sensitive emotionally um, with those that also have sensory um, issues? Like, do we see those happening together a lot or is that like a whole nother thing? Um, it can. So it can be very related and it can be separate. Um, but um, if you can, you know, think way back to the beginning of the talk, I had that picture where it was like the person in the middle and like all these different things that combine to basically make that person's experience. Um, and, you know, if if you are someone who is more sensitive um, to emotions, um, not only is that kind of um, under the inter interoception umbrella, but that also will make um, you kind of more towards that sympathetic, that activated nervous system. So then um, sensory input that maybe, um, you know, if you were in a calm emotional state, you could be like, I don't notice it or I'm fine with it. Uh, when you're in a more sensitive emotional state, suddenly like that sensory input is like very grating or distressful. Um, or you may, you know, if you're a sensory seeker or craver, you're like, I gotta move, I gotta get up, I can't sit still. Um, so it definitely, it definitely all plays a part. Um, that's not, that's not to say that it's always, you know, hundred percent correlation, but there is a lot of interaction, um, between like emotion, mood, energy, sensory sensitivities. And when I work with clients, um, I very rarely separate out anything. I kind of look at them as a whole. We talk through situations of like what, what was going on, um, in many different aspects of their body, um, that caused a certain reaction that they want to work on. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. Um, and Hi. Hi. Is it my turn? Um, I have a question about um, potential classroom accommodations. I have an 11 year old that's in a new middle school. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, it's an awesome school, but unfortunately the classroom's really bright, loud, small, crowded. 19 boys and five girls. So a some of that like oh. rowdy energy. Uh -huh. And I noticed I was in there um, just yesterday and I noticed they have a like a fancy screen, you push a button and it comes down and it's behind a wall of window, <laughs> like behind oh. it, which I know for me is always like really hard to like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm always like turning out lights in rooms, turning off fluorescence or yeah. closing blinds and stuff. And it looks like there are no blinds. And, um, I'm just curious if you have any kind of off the top of your head ideas about potential accommodations or even things to say, because they're trying to like use rewards to um, get my kid. He's sort of hanging out behind a book case. This sort of mm -hmm. blocks some of the noise and the rowdiness and the light of the wall of windows. Um, you know, so they're trying to use rewards, which just isn't you know, isn't um, mitigating the situation. Yeah, and that makes sense because the rewards aren't gonna overshadow the sensory sensitivities. Um, it's just gonna kind of try and convince him to um, fight basically what his body is telling him more. Um, so in general with classrooms, uh, my favorite thing is to have like the school OT especially because um, They'll, they'll be extra um, sensitive to this kind of thing, but to see how the classroom as a whole can adapt um, rather than focusing um, on one, one kid or another, especially in middle school, um, that can be really hard socially. Um, maybe having um, the OT kind of stop by, spend a few minutes in the class, and then they may be able to write up a plan um, for the teacher of how it can be comfortable for every kid in the class and the teacher. Um, so things like, um, you know, cutting down on clutter, 
maybe there are blinds for the windows or a lot of classrooms have an option where you can dim the lights instead of turning them off. Um, and even if you can't do that all the time, maybe having set times throughout the day, like especially if there's quiet reading time, um, you know, as long as as long as no one in the class has um, trouble reading, you know, if, if you dim the lights, that might be a good time to do it. So kind of thinking about like, you know, on the the scale of the classroom of, of a whole of what can be done. Um, and if there's like a 504 or an IEP plan, um, that can be something discussed at the meeting um, or hopefully of the contact info for the school OT. Um, and you can you can talk to them about that um, individually. It really depends on the kid. Um, I I don't always hear of a lot of success of like individual kids using individual things because no one wants to stand out. Um, and also, you know, it takes brain power to use um, sensory strategies and accommodations. And if you're already overwhelmed, sometimes giving you more things to do is difficult, but um, things like fidgets and they don't have to be like, like, you know, the um, like an official fidget um, that can be playing with an eraser or something. Um, that's just an example of kind of, um, you know, a way to be like low key about something. So like using, using things in his environment to feel more comfortable, to get what he needs and to kind of block out what he, what he doesn't need. Um, that can be useful on an individual level. Um, but hopefully the, the OT and the teacher um, can work together on that. Um, that would be an OT console. Usually it doesn't, it doesn't take um, as much convincing the powers that be um, for a quick consult like that. Oh, thanks for your question. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jay? Sorry, I think Effie was, um, had a hand up uh, beforehand, but it keeps going down on my screen. So I'm not sure if Effie's still on. I don't see Effie on. Okay, uh, Jay? about like EDS specifically with pain and realizing that we are or failing to realize. Uh, Jay, it looks like you're cutting out. Um, if we don't get a good connection, um, could you post, post the question in the chat? Cause I definitely wanna make sure I, I still address that. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Okay, I was asking about pain and whether or not we realize that something is misaligned or injured, um, because I know that I've definitely gone hours or days before realizing that something is actually really wrong. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think that that's a bit of an EDS thing. And I would love it if you would talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, like, what even is pain? Especially because, like, is it? only the bright stuff or is it the dull stuff that sneaks up on you and is nausea pain sometimes etc oh that's really interesting that's almost getting into philosophy um there's definitely more than i could possibly go into about about what is pain and sometimes it does get kind of philosophical um uh but so it's it's just the sensations in your body that happen um you know when when your body senses something is not right so like if you get a, a scratch, the sense, um, the senses in your skin, um, if it's a deep cut, like maybe deeper in your body will um, kind of send alarm bells to your brain. Um, and then that will get kind of mixed around with your past experience. Um, you know, before I had a scratch and I was okay, I put a bandaid on it or before I had a scratch and it got infected and I was in the hospital with MRSA and oh my gosh, this is the worst. Also, like it gets mixed in with your emotions and things like that. So it's really complicated. Um, and it could, you know, it definitely could happen that you don't notice that you're injured or you don't notice the severity that you're injured until later. Um, so, you know, because we have impaired proprioception and maybe, you know, impaired interoception, uh, we might not, you know, maybe our, our wrist slips out and, you know, there's a subluxation there um, and we don't necessarily notice until the muscle spasm sets in um, or there's like secondary things or our hand starts tingling because the nerve is getting pressed on. So that can definitely happen. Um, a good thing to do. Is, sorry, sorry to interrupt. But also differentiating whether this joint is injured or the one next along is actually the injury point. I know that spent yeah. messing with one only to realize that it actually was always the other one. 
Yeah, the signals can definitely get confused. Um, and it's something that, um, you know, if you um, kind of uh, use the word practice, um, so if you like really think through, like what are the other cues? Well, I just lifted something heavy with my right wrist. So it's probably not my left wrist that's hurt, even if my body's kind of confused. Or I heard a really loud like kathunk, um, which isn't necessarily mean something bad, but it's a clue. Um, so, you know, kind of taking other things into consideration and then really like kind of like almost briefly meditating on it. Um, and you can kind of practice to get more in touch um, with your body. So um, a lot of people, or I guess I can use my own experience that um, when I was like in my late teens, early twenties, my neck started shifting. And a lot of times I wouldn't recognize something was wrong until I started having like horrible muscle spasm or neurological deficits, something like that. Um, but as I kind of like got used to it and got used to the feeling and got kind of like sensitized to like, when I feel like this shift, that probably means I need to address it. Um, you know, I need to lay down with my heating pad or, or whatever my plan was at that time. And I did get better at it and more sensitive to it. Um, it's not a guarantee. Um, and you know, um, I wish I had a guarantee. A lot of these answers are that oh, it depends or it's difficult or it takes practice. Um, but one of, one of the really, um, helpful things is to kind of, um, evaluate the whole situation and see if there's other clues there. Um, and, you know, and practice that mindfulness of being in touch with your body. And, um, and so you might notice things more, um, it, it, it could work. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Effie, I think you had your hand up next. Yes. Hi, I keep getting booted out. So hopefully I'll be able to stay connected. Um, I just found this very interesting, and this is the first uh, Zoom meeting I've been able to participate in, so I'm really grateful that this particular topic was so vital to what I'm recognizing with my kids, because I am I was diagnosed four years ago with EDS, but we're monitoring both of our children. My oldest is presenting, as he's getting older, more and more sensory issues. Recently, mm -hmm. it's more the audible Mm -hmm. But I found that he falls into every single category that you mentioned. Do you see that often? Yeah. So as much as I kind of stress the idea of like, I don't put people into boxes and you can be all over the place and, you know, want loud sounds sometimes and soft sounds sometimes, um, you know, actually these boxes are there for a reason. And that's because some people do fit into them. So some people are going to overreact to like, um, all different kinds of sensory input across the board. Um, so that's, you know, just as valid as, as a presentation. Um, and, you know, if he's having that much trouble in so many areas, that would definitely be when I would recommend um, working with a therapist, um, you know, maybe more than one. So like an occupational therapist for the sensory aspect and then a, a psychotherapist um, for the emotional or like the cognitive processing of it all. Um, aspect of it. Um, and, you know, I know not everyone has access to those things as much, um, but, you know, in terms of best practice, that would definitely be what I would recommend. I, th I think that would be a good case. Like if you, um, if, if I had, you know, a client call me and describe their kid like that, I would, um, you know, say that they were appropriate for OT services. Um, so, so that, that can be an, an avenue. Um, I'm, I don't know how old he is, um, but um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I was gonna say being a teenager can make things, you know, there's a lot going on. Talk about like, you know, everything kind of, um, interacting with each other, like those hormones, the body changes, um, you know, just going through a growth spurt can get your sense of where your body is in space off, which can get everything else off. So, um, you know, it's a tough time and, um, it could get better, you know, doing nothing with age, but, um, I say, why wait? you know, what can we do now to make him more comfortable? Um, and it sounds like he definitely, um, you know, would, would be in that, um, category of, of OT, um, could help. Um, and also just personally, I, I was very much like that. <laughs> I, um, there's a, a screening you can take. We took it in grad school and we were doing statistics on it and I was two standard deviations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 
Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I think you froze again. Yeah, my reception is really bad, so you're cutting it along. But I'm trying to catch what you're saying. Okay. Um. Oh, I think I think she left. Well, anyways, if if anyone gets cut off or anything, feel free to pop in the chat. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Oh, looks like we have. Hi, me? Yeah. Just to tell you. My bad. I'm sorry. So I was really excited about this meeting and I just realized the time and I miss most of it. I'm 36. I just got diagnosed with heads, hypermobile EDS, and I just had a genetics consult on Wednesday. They think I have a lot more. But I hear you guys talking about our kids and about so is this topic I'm guessing relating to kid like how do you know if your kids have it? Um, no, so um, this is for all ages, actually. Um, I it just in general, kids, you know, because they're learning and growing and don't have um, as good of coping mechanisms, they might present more strongly with sensory processing problems. So it might, um, you know, it might be something we see more in pediatrics, but those sensory kids grow up to be sensory adults. So it's definitely applicable. I'm so sorry. That's my question because I'm trying to jump in and catch up. And I'm sorry if I'm repeating anything to anybody that was on time. Um, but sensory, I have issues with sensory. Like I said, this is I just got diagnosed. This is all new. I've been gaslit for the last five years, being called a hypochondriac and historionic disorder and all this stuff. And now they're like, oh yeah, you're messed up. Cool. So you're talking about sensory. Can you, long story short, just explain that to me? This is the first time I'm hearing about that linked to this because again this is all new i'm trying to jump in sure um so this is recorded um so you can go right back to the beginning you don't have to just Perfect. be good um well i can i can give like a, a quick summary too because it might be good for a recap um so we have different sensory systems in ot we talk about eight um so that's like the five you learn in school like vision hearing smell taste I probably will forget some off the top of my head. Also, like where our body is in space, where our head is in space, and internal sensations in our body. Um, and people, um, you know, process information differently. Um, and that's okay. But sometimes that difference can lead to like functional problems or discomfort. And that's when we may want to do something about it. Um, and there's all sorts of people who deal with that. OTs um, kind of look at, the whole picture of all the different sensory systems, but PTs also work with certain sensory systems, um, uh, like vision therapists, certain doctors. So there's a lot of people who can address the, the issues. And um, in general, um, the, the framework I use is you can be kind of over-responsive to sensory input, uh, like everything is too loud, um, you know, or like someone brushes up against you and like, oh my gosh, like I can't stand it. You can be under responding. So like food all over your face and not noticing. You can be sensory craving um, where it's like, I can't sit still. I have to move constantly or I have to taste all these, you know, strong tastes. Um, or you can be some mishmash of all of the above. And that includes like touching things. Like you have to touch and feel the texture. Like I have this craziness about lights, <laughs> textures and smells is smells included in this like sense yeah. like I have crazy nose and I'm just I can smell everything I can smell things that nobody else can smell I'm like they can make me sick they can make me happy nostalgic I can taste smells is mm -hmm. that colors and just all the sensories just or like you said under feel as well simultaneously yeah, so it, it depends and it depends on the person and the situation. So that's like um, if you don't notice something, other people will notice. So like selective hearing loss. So someone's talking to you and you're just not processing it. Um, um, that can happen too. Um, so there's like lots of different, you know, different different ways for things to go, um, you know, wrong or or be different in a way that causes distress. Um, so yeah, hopefully. In the talk, I went over um, each sensory system, kind of what 
um, what it might look like if there's a problem with that sensory processing, and then a few things that you can do um, to help yourself in the future, kind of like practicing, um, and then also what you can do in the moment to feel better. Um, so hopefully that will be a good resource. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. Wow. Things in the chat box, um, one that I thought others might benefit from. Um, any tips for how to remember to check in with yourself when you're in a social situation with lots of sensory input, rather than just getting overstimulated? How do you like stop yourself and do some self self calming things? Um, that's really hard to do, um, especially um, because focus can be an issue if you have sensory processing issues. So remembering to do that when you're focused on something else can be really hard. So I kind of experiment with different ways with my clients, find something that works with them. Um, if you have like one of those smart watches, um, there's some programs where you can have it vibrate every certain amount of time. Um, and hopefully you won't get desensitized to it and not notice it. You'll feel the vibration and be like, okay, I'm going to do a check-in. Um, one of my favorite things to do also, like if I'm in a, a busy situation, a social situation, is like a bathroom break is a really nice way to like kind of remove yourself from the commotion and have like a moment to yourself where you can do kind of a more thorough check-in. Um, you know, if there's, uh, you know, say you're going to a, um, a show um, and, you know, there's going to be intermission, you can prepare ahead of time and say at intermission, I'm going to check in with myself. Do I have to go to the bathroom? Am I overwhelmed? Should I put on my sunglasses? Should I put on my earplugs? Things like that. Um, and as you, um, as you practice doing these check-ins and noticing things, it will become easier um, for most people. Um, you know, I try with my clients get to the point where these things are habits, because once they're in a habit, anyone who's tried to break a bad habit knows it's very difficult. So if you can use that brain power to get in the habit of doing this, um, either through reminders or kind of just like mental force of will of trying to get yourself to check in with yourself, you know, however, however often, if you do that often enough, hopefully it does become more natural. Um, and so you're not using all of that, all of that brain power, um, to try and do that. But that's a really good question. And the solution really depends on the person. Um, and I really encourage people to, to try lots of different things. Um, with sensory processing, um, kind of like with um, executive function, which is kind of that focus and cognitive aspect of things, um, you know, it's really, really based on the person. And you can try, you know, tens of different things that have no effect. And then you find the one thing that does. So keep at it, you know, keep practicing, find something that works. Um, cause it is really important to be in touch with yourself. Um, cause you have to know what your needs are before you can address those needs. Thanks. I think we'll try to take one last question. I want to be respectful of the time. We're just a few minutes over, but if it's a quick one, Adrian, you want to shoot with a question and then we'll wrap it up. Adrian. Uh, put it in the chat. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, this might take me a minute. Um, let me see. And if if I don't get to um, everyone's questions or you come up with them later, like please definitely shoot me an email. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, to get back to everyone and make sure that everyone has their question answered. Let's see if I can speed read this. Okay, like missing a body map. Yeah, that's definitely something that um, tends to happen more in people with EDS because of that impaired um, proprioception. Um, and they're not 100% sure why, but I have I have to guess it um, has something to do with our hypermobility. Um, so this, you know, it's also important to have reasonable expectations. We, we may never, um, you know, be fully in touch with our bodies, but hopefully practicing, um, you know, if you are feeling off, 
thinking, why do I feel off? I'm in pain. Okay. Where's the pain? And if, you know, poking around on your body is what it takes, especially in the beginning, you know, as long as you're gentle, (laughs) um, that's okay. That's, that's completely fine. That even might be something I recommend, you know, whatever works. If it, if it's like slowly moving through your range of motion and saying, oh, okay, it's this joint right here. And I didn't know that until I was, you know, you know, trying to move things and see, see if they were moving right. Um, um, so yeah, let me, I, I'm almost done. I want to make sure I address the whole thing. Um, and yes, so this can be a bunch of different things. This can be, um, the interoception, um, the proprioception, um, and maybe, you know, some of the, some of the other sensory systems, um, even though I kind of talk about them as distinct sets of things, because you can kind of map distinct um, like passages um, through the nervous system, they all kind of um, mix together. Um, so, like EDS. sorry, what was that? Just like everything else with EDS. Yeah, yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> it's really complicated. Um, and that's why I love what I do. Um, I really like um, you know, working with complex and, um, you know, chronic illness, because there's a lot going on. Um, and I think I see a lot of hope in that. If there's a lot going on, there's a lot that's there to address. Um, so a lot of improvement that can be made. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, that's my optimism. Um, but, you know, if you're not in, in an optimi- optimistic space, it's okay to be overwhelmed by it too. I, I used to do the like small movements thing to feel where everything was. And I kind of stopped doing that, but I might have to pick that up again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you're doing it gentle and you're, um, you know, and you're taking that moment to really be in tune with things that can be like that gentle movement can be a way to really localize what, you know, what joint, what muscle, like what's going on. Um, um, and also with the poking, you know, you mentioned you, you went to PT and anyone who's gotten a massage or went to PT and they do that massage myofascial work, you know, you'll know when they get to that knot. Um, and a lot of them have really good, clever hands that can feel out those spaces. Um, so that's something you can do on yourself too. you know, feel out like, where is, where is that muscle knot, um, you know, in, on my body. Um, and, and a lot of times you'll, you'll know when you get there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh huh. Thanks for the question. Great. Well, thank you, Emily, for um, your presentation and um, all of the great question and answer and participation from everybody. Um, really appreciate uh, you taking the time to spend with us up here in Oregon. Thank you so much. I wish I could hi, be there. Hi, Nancy. And I love Oregon. <laughs> Well, that's my mom, Nancy. Yeah. She also treats EDS. She's a physical therapist. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, this was like great participation. Um, it's something I'm really passionate about. So I love sharing it with other people. And um, feel free to email me with any questions um, or, or yeah, any, any comments, anything like that. Um, I'd love to stay in touch. So thank you so much for asking me. I really enjoyed this. Good night, everyone. Uh, Heather, I'm going to put you back in charge.
I can't get mine to uh, it's going to shut down my computer. It's stuck. I'll close it. I just was trying to find the email address to share with somebody. Natalia, I think, asked the question, but actually, I think she's gone now. So, all right. I'm shutting her down. down.